I would like to acknowledge the work that happened in the network prior to my arrival under the leadership of Jim Gray, who I wish that I could have met, uh, but did not, but of Richard Sterling, who I know is here this morning with us, who built this organization to a place that it was so sound. And not many folks get to come into leadership positions with an organization that has nothing broken. We had a strong network of teachers. We were doing phenomenal advocacy work in DC. The finances were strong. We had clean audits for many years. And I was like, you mean I get to inherit something that is this sound? And I know that Richard certainly did not do it on his own, but I am really aware and very appreciative of the work that Richard has done to strengthen the National Writing Project. Richard. Richard said that I could call him whenever I wanted to, and I have. <laughs> At any given moment in our life, we have choices. At times, the number of choices might seem overwhelming. The choice of choosing just one crayon from a box of eight for a three-year-old might be just as overwhelming and daunting as choosing what to wear for a middle-aged woman. Last autumn was an important decision point for the National Writing Project, and I was truly honored and humbled to be asked to join NWP. And I felt that saying, yes, I will, was indeed the perfect choice. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to keep weaving those things in. Now, nearly a year later, I know it was the perfect choice at the perfect time. And I continue to be honored and incredibly humbled to work with an amazing, talented group of people in service to you, our teacher stars in the network. As I said before, the theme of this general session is our writing and learning connect us. And so for the next several minutes, I thought I would explore different types of connections. All of us in this room and across the network are connected through the mission of the National Writing Project to improve writing and learning in the nation's schools. One glance around this room at this fine looking group of people. And I can see that we have made the choice to spend our precious time in the company of colleagues focused on a common cause. I learned from reading our monographs and our articles and from listening to personal testimonies during my visits to local sites and to national programs in numerous conversations that our commitment to the inquiry for the improvement of writing and learning does indeed connect us. Our experiences connect us. Many of us in this room have had the experience of being considered other, an outsider, and so I know that many of you will be able to relate to a particular part of my history. I grew up in a small town outside of Columbus, Ohio, where I attended predominantly white schools and where I learned early on the importance of finding connections. I could either find connections with my schoolmates or I could be isolated. From a young age, I became quite practiced in connecting with others. Sometimes the points of connection would be so obvious and expected, and I only needed to take that first step to build a bridge. I don't mean to make it seem universally easy in terms of building bridges, but right now there's just not enough time to unpack both the toll and the residual benefits of bridge building. That will have to be another time. 
However, being viewed as other means, there are times when folks, including myself, find particular connections unexpected, yet pleasant surprises. Our teaching connects us. One benefit I gained from my early experiences as a connector was that I was so practiced in connecting with students, particularly of different races and ethnicities. However, I remember clearly the first time Josh, a prospective graduate student, came to my office to discuss enrolling in the program. I looked at him, and immediately I began scanning my cultural database looking for information in terms of how I could welcome him, greet him in a way that felt inclusive to him. So I'm, I'm looking at him, and in the time that it took Josh to say, are you Dr. Washington? And for me to respond, I had registered visual information, and I had made a guess, and it was a guess, about what would be inclusive for him. So this is what I saw. White guy, check. Beard, check. Yamaka, check. What looked like the fringe of a talus hanging underneath his Argyle sweater vest, check. Gray or tan dungarees, check. Tiva sandals with socks, check. <laughs> a book backpack with one of those high-tech water bottles attached with a carabiner, check. So right away, I put all these things together and I go, outdoorsy, Orthodox Jew, maybe in his 20s, uh, not certain. The combination said to me, you can be welcoming without touching him. You don't have to shake his hand to say, come on in. And I think it's important for me to say that what we perceive from external expressions of culture aren't always true. But in this case with Josh, I found out later through many conversations that my perceptions were correct. Josh enrolled in the program, and over the next 18 minutes or so, 18 months or so, I mean, we made several academic connections, which eventually led to his graduate research project. And I was surprised with where we got to in his project, because we decided to use something from some expertise in my background that he was very inter interested in as an outdoorsy person. And that's my experience in experiential education with something called group initiatives. And we paired that with Hebrew language instruction. Who would have thought? <laughs> I could not have predicted that my connection with Josh would have been what it was. Because for me, it was unexpected. What would it mean if we spent more time looking for the unexpected connection? Unearthing the unexpected would give us information about ourselves and the expectations we hold. For me, in that situation with Josh, I got to look at my own assumptions about who Josh was and what he would want in terms of a graduate program, in terms of an advisor. And I assumed that he would not want me as an advisor. That maybe he would feel uncomfortable with a woman or maybe he wouldn't respect a woman as an advisor. And I have to tell you, I was wrong. And it's important to be able to say that. Reading connects us. When I read the book Kite Runner, I was connected to desire of this young, well-to-do boy living in Afghanistan who wanted to be accepted by a father who was trying to connect with his son who seemed so very different than himself. Reading Octavia Butler's 2000 book, 2005 book, Fledgling, I connected to the fear of rejection that comes when those who have been viewed as other are the first to integrate families. Our students connect us. Two weeks ago, I had the opportunity to read a thinking book of a second grade student from Sierra Elementary School in Oroville, California, whom I will refer to as Pia. Pia's thinking book was a combination of words and drawings, things that you would expect in a notebook that was used for note-taking, class lessons, and journaling. 
I learned that Pia had hit a classmate on the playground for that classmate saying something that he didn't like. And then his classmate hit him back. <laughs> Reading Pia's thinking book, I am reminded again that writing provides a haven, as well as a way for us to connect with what we think and feel with what we are trying to figure out. In this case, I got the sense that Pia knew that it really wasn't OK to hit someone. And writing in his thinking book was a way for him to tell his teacher. At that same school, I observed a teacher consultant, who I know is here with us today because I saw her yesterday, Suzanne Leinbarger from the Northern California Writing Project. I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Suzanne right? and those fifth grade students who helped me prepare for this presentation. Suzanne was modeling a lesson on identifying keywords to fifth grade students. They were learning how to understand and summarize complex text, identifying words that they already understood. And watching that lesson reminded me of a strategy I used earlier in my career when I was teaching by instinct, certainly not by formal preparation on the teaching of reading and writing skills. For years, I taught courses in law to students who were planning to work in school and community settings. As a group, we would spend numerous class periods toward the beginning of every semester trying to decipher legal text. Basically, we were looking for keywords to help unlock the meaning of legalese. One of the reasons I enjoyed teaching this subject was because that no other class, particularly whether they were undergrads or graduate students, gave me that opportunity to witness that magical moment when students all of a sudden go from just reading or hearing words that they can read but they don't really understand to when that bulb goes off and they get it. The desire to find connections are not bound by age, though I will tell you that young folks, and you know this, are much more willing to be openly curious. I don't know what happens. We get to high school, then we get to college and beyond, and all of a sudden, we think it's not okay to be curious out loud in front of other people, particularly around those sensitive issues. So I'm gonna tell you a little story about a child who was curious out loud. Peter was four at the time, Peter, I can tell you, does not appreciate this story. Peter has gone on, graduated from high school, and is even almost finishing college. So we're going to go back to the 80s. And we were, his parents were hosting an informal dinner party. There were about, I don't know, he, his parents, and maybe five others of us around their dining room table. In the situation, adults are talking and Peter's being a very uh, polite young person who's just sitting there and eating. Then all of a sudden there's that lull in the conversation, you know, the one that just sort of happens from time to time. And Peter decided it must be his time to talk. So he used that lull and piped up really clearly, Sharon, are you that color all over? Now, your response is great. The response at that dining room table was, <laughs> you would have thought that somebody had dropped a bomb. All the other adults who were white, except for myself, were like looking at the ceiling, <laughs> looking at each other, you know, anything but at me. So I thought, you know, I could either behave like the other adults, and I decided, nah. <laughs> what Peter wants is a response, because he's just outwardly curious. And I figure he's trying to connect. He's trying to figure out, is there something that I can know? Um, is there some way that I can sort of, in maybe Sharon's just really tanned. <laughs> you know, because I understand that I could get tan. So I looked at Peter, and I said, you know, Peter, and I'm, again, I was experiential education. I took my shirt, I lifted it up a modest amount. 
And I said, you know, Peter, I am. And he goes, oh, okay. And he goes back to eating. <laughs> Meanwhile, my poor friends were struggling. They were still struggling. They're like, oh my God, oh my God. You know, and, and he was just being curious out loud. I think there is nothing more basic than the desire to connect with others. I know that often I connect in the ways that a person just moves the world. It may not even be something specific, but something that I just feel. And I also connect through ideas. The number of young people who wrote a letter to the next president is a testament to their desire to connect their thoughts on real issues in real time to the next president of the United States. The next president of the United States. Mm -hmm. We are living in a time of great connection. Living in a time when millions of people were able to connect across generations and class and language and race and ethnicity and geographic regions. A time when a nation was able to connect to a message from a man that for many was unexpected and welcomed. I stand on the shoulders of those who went before connected to those who may not have been able to see my path during this lifetime, but nonetheless, what they wanted for me and countless others was not to be bound by their condition of enslavement, but by their hope and determination. Not bound by the limitations of how others may see us, but by the possibility of how we can see ourselves. I benefit today because people I know and those that I don't know worked and often struggled to make the life I lead possible. Like them, I too am working for a future I cannot see. And that future, in my mind, I try to think of as five to seven generations. So I may not be here to see that. You say may, <laughs> which I believe is possible. But today, right now, this moment is the time we have to connect. And today, I make a commitment to make a connection to a new idea. Right now, I commit to reaching beyond what I currently know. And at this moment, I choose to reside in hope. Hope that we will continue to connect with others to create policies that support sound practice in the teaching of literacy education across the curriculum in all grades. Hope that increasingly others will see the connections between effective literacy education today and academic and work life success tomorrow. Hope that we can continue to make a difference in our schools for the betterment of all students. As educators, we expect that our commitment to teaching and learning connects us. Connections with people are those precious gifts. Sometimes the connections aren't with other people, but with other beings who share this planet with us. I'm going to close with a short story about the unexpected. This happened when I was an undergraduate in college. I was a jogger. I went to Ohio State, and I was setting off to jog from my college apartment down to Tuttle Park and back again. The loop was about two miles. Now, we had had reports over the previous several months that at night, after dark, Tuttle Park wasn't necessarily the safest place for a woman to be, particularly a single woman out jogging. So I said, I'll jog early in the morning. Because somehow in my mind, I had decided that people who mean ill will don't get up early. <laughs> they just don't. 
So I'm jogging, and I will tell you that the jog down to Tuttle Park was downhill. So the hardest part of the jog was going to be the second half going uphill. So I'm jogging, I'm feeling pretty good about it. It's about, I don't know, 6.30 in the morning. And I start coming through Tuttle Park. And all of a sudden, I see a man get up off of a park bench and start walking toward me. It's about 100 yards or so. And I'm thinking, uh-huh. Do I quickly turn around and go the other direction? Do I not show fear? What do I do here? And I kept moving forward, and now it's about 50 yards. And I'm like, hmm, I think I still have enough kick in me. You know, he doesn't look so sharp, you know. He looks a little out of shape. <laughs> so I'm running along, and out of nowhere, this large German Shepherd dog comes running over to me as though it had been like, you know, doing something over there and came back to me. And this dog runs with me for the next mile. And as we were running through the rest of the park, the man saw the dog come up to me and immediately shrunk back. And that dog ran me all the way home. I never saw the dog again. I did not, had never seen the dog previously. And that experience has stayed with me because for me it is a wonderful reminder that connections are everywhere and oftentimes unexpected. Whew. So what would it mean if we were to be open to the unexpected? I do believe we may indeed change the world. Thank you.